learning never ends at McMaster. Welcome to an opportunity to engage your curiosity from the comfort of your own environment. This online series is sponsored by the McMaster Alumni Association as part of our goal to connect with our global alumni and their curious minds. Ooh. Ah. My name is Ben Pierce and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at McMaster University. Thanks for joining us for another For the Curious Mind webinar. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of this presentation. Just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and I'll try and answer as many questions as possible. Now, today I'm gonna to be discussing the age-old question, how did life on Earth begin? Now, before we get to how life on Earth began, it's important to try and answer the other five Ws about life because they really set the stage for the big how question. So let's begin by first answering the five Ws. What is life? Who was first life? When did life begin? Where did life begin? And unfortunately, I won't be answering why life began today because uh, science can't really answer why. So let's begin with what is life? What does it actually mean to be alive? You know, this is a, actually a, a very difficult question that many people have thought about and come up with many, many definitions. But what's really hard about it is that you have to try and find a definition that includes everything that we would intuitively consider to be living, while also excluding things that we definitely do not consider to be living, but meet some of these definitions. NASA came up with a pretty good, concise definition a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And this is my favorite definition. And it basically just says, if you are going to be considered to be living, you need to be self-sustaining and you need to be capable of evolving. In other words, you need to be capable of reproducing uh, imperfectly, making imperfect copies of yourself, uh, which would be in the case of humans, would be uh, your offspring, your children. But just thinking about this definition, you can already see a problem arising. You know, viruses unfortunately do not meet this definition of life as they're not self-sustaining. You know, viruses actually need living cells in order to reproduce. They take uh, their, their, their components from the cell to build themselves, build copies of themselves. So sorry viruses, uh, you're not living. Now I wanna begin this webinar today by playing a game with you all and it's called living or non-living. All you have to do is when I show you an image of an organism, is try and determine whether it fits this NASA definition of life, which I'll remind you is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. So let's begin with something easy. Is this organism living or non-living? You may recognize this organism as a horse. What do you think? If you answered yes, this is living, you would be correct. Horses are certainly self-sustaining and capable of reproducing and evolving. How about this, this little guy here? You may not recognize this organism, and if you don't, that's okay, because they're very, very small. They're only 0.1 millimeters in length. So this is actually an image of this organism under a microscope. It's called the tardigrade, and it's an animal, believe it or not, and actually is one of the most durable organisms on the planet. It can survive the vacuum of space for decades, and it can survive much more radiation than any other organism on the planet. So what do you think about the tardigrade? Is this living or non-living? If you'd answered living, then you'd be right. The tardigrades, just like horses, are self-sustaining, capable of reproducing and evolving. Okay, how about this organism? This is a mule. Is this organism living or non-living based on that NASA definition? Well, in fact, it's actually not living. Mules are the result of a female horse and male donkey having offspring and they're sterile. So they cannot reproduce and evolve. They cannot undergo any sort of Darwinian evolution. So unfortunately, uh, mule, you're not alive. Okay, how about RNA? Now I haven't introduced RNA yet, and I'll do so in a bit, but 
if you don't recognize RNA, it's actually capable of, uh, it's, it's uh, sorry, it's responsible for some very important uh, features in the body. What it does is it copies the DNA blueprint, uh, which is your genes, your information, what makes you, and it takes it over to the ribosome, and the ribosome takes that blueprint and it translates it into the language of proteins, and those proteins carry out all the functions in your body. So that's what RNA does today. And uh, now you have to ask yourself, is it living or is it non-living? Well, theoretically, RNA is actually living. It actually does meet that definition. And I'll explain why in just a moment, but just to summarize this exercise here, clearly you can see this NASA definition isn't perfect, but let's use it anyway, because really there is no perfect definition. And actually this definition encapsulates 99.99% .99 of all organisms. Uh, so it's, it's pretty good. Just sorry to the mule. Okay, so we answered what is life? We have our NASA definition. Now let's move on to who was first life. And here we're going back to RNA, which I just introduced, and now I'll properly introduce RNA. So you can see on the left here, an image of a molecule which has four building blocks. Each building block has a different letter associated with it. So this RNA molecule is four building blocks long. Each building block is called a nucleotide and it contains three components. The component with the letter and the, and the unique color here is called a nucleobase. And there's four different types of letters, C, G, A, and U. And then there's also a ribose molecule in the middle in gray, and then a phosphate on the left in turquoise. And those make up the backbone of your RNA molecule Whereas the nucleobases, they're in charge of pairing so that you can make a copy of this molecule. C's pair with G's and A's pair with U's. So you can imagine taking this molecule here and pairing a, a similar RNA molecule with going from top to bottom, G, C, U, A. And then when you separate that, you've made a complementary strand. All you have to do now is copy that complementary strand one more time and you arrive back at what you started with. So that's how RNA can be copied. Now, how does RNA actually fit this NASA definition of life? Well, RNA is actually an information polymer, just like DNA, so you can store a piece of information in it. I'm going to make an analogy to a computer. So how does a computer store information? Well, on the lowest level, it's in ones and zeros. So in a sense, it's a two-letter language, just ones and zeros called binary. Now, RNA is just like that, except it has four letters. And these four letters can be put into a different sequence, a different permutation, and then you have a different piece of information. Now, all of you are actually a unique permutation of DNA-based sequences. And when you uh, mate with your partner, you make a combination of your base sequences with their base sequences, and you create an organism, your offspring, which has another unique permutation of DNA-based sequences. So that's your blueprint. Now, RNA can, uh, can act as a template when it's unfolded, which means that in this form right here on the left, you can actually attach nucleotides to it to make a copy. But what's cool about RNA is that when it's not unfolded, when it's folded, as you can see in the figure on this page, it can actually act like a protein. And you know, when we want to copy DNA, for instance, it requires a lot of proteins to unzip the DNA and then grab nucleotides from the environment and, and make a copy of that DNA. Now, we don't have, so, so in the, on the early earth, there wouldn't have been proteins, but RNA can do that just by folding on itself. It now becomes catalytic and it can now, uh, it can now make copies of some template of RNA. So in a sense, it can reproduce and evolve. But there's a problem here. So this is just a disclaimer. Uh, an RNA molecule that can be folded sometimes and unfolded sometimes, therefore being able to act as something to be copied and therefore also doing the copying has not been found yet in the lab. Uh, scientists have been working very hard at this and we have come close. There is an RNA mo molecule which can fold sometimes and make co uh, copies of itself by grabbing two strands of RNA and putting them together. Um, but unfortunately, it's not the same as grabbing just little nucleotides from the environment. So it's not perfect. This is really the holy grail of origins of life chemistry. 
finding this molecule means that you've created life in the lab. So you better believe people are looking for this RNA molecule. So why might RNA describe first life on Earth? Why, why is RNA the who was first life? Well, let's think about life as we know it. Life, in every life form on Earth today, has the same three components. It has DNA as its genetic molecule, RNA, which does the trans transitioning and translating, so you're transcribing and translating, and then you have proteins, which carry out all the functions in your body. And this is actually a really, really complex uh, system. You know, just to, just to do it, just to make a protein, your RNA has to copy your DNA and it has to bring it over to the ribosome. The ribosome then picks different styles of RNA from the environment, which have amino acids attached to them. And then it builds this protein out of those amino acids following something called the genetic code, uh, which is essentially like an instruction manual for making proteins. Uh, so it's, it's really actually quite complex. And it's really unlikely that something like that just emerged spontaneously. Much more likely, as in our universe, things seem to obey Darwinian evolution. So much more likely is that there was some stage between basic organics, something that was not living, and life as we know it, this DNA, RNA, protein-based life. And we think that that is RNA. Now I'm going to make an analogy here to the evolution of the eye. You know, the eye that we have, and it's not so different to the eye of the squid. Something like this didn't just emerge spontaneously, but you can imagine just a little limpet floating around in the ocean. You know, it, it gained these light-sensitive cells, and then it was able to determine lightness from darkness. So it knew the sun was over here, and it knew it wasn't over here, and it can use that information to maybe find food. Then you get to the abalone, which takes its light-sensitive cells and, and turns it into a cup. Uh, and just like a telescope, which focuses light waves, so you see a magnified image, this is able to be more sensitive to dimmer lights. So it's a little bit better than the limpet at determining lightness from darkness. Now, imagine the nautilus, which actually uh, fills a, a cavity with fluid and, and cuts it off at the top so you get a little pinhole camera. Well, this is great. Now you actually have a full image, a blurry one, albeit, but you still have a full image. So you can determine friend from foe and predator from prey. Then you get to the marine snail and you actually cover your, your pinhole camera so no gunk gets in there and you create a lens. So now you're able to focus your image and determine uh, predator from prey with a lot more uh, discerning power. And then you get to the squid and your lens is a lot, uh, a lot more better shaped and you get a fully highly resolved camera type eye where you went through all these functional intermediates. They were able to do some things that the, eye, the full eye could do, but not all of them. And they could do them pretty well. So this is how evolution works. And this is why we think RNA, which can act as both essentially a protein and DNA, so it can store genetic information and it can catalyze its own replication in a single molecule. So it would be in the middle of this uh, analogy here as, as a functional intermediate between non-life and life as we know it. So who was first life? We think RNA. Let's move on to when did life begin? Now, as it turns out, we can't actually nail this down to a precise date. You know, I can't say life began on August 24th minus 4.5 billion BC. Uh, we just don't know exactly when it happened, but we can constrain an interval based on the earliest time when the Earth became habitable and also the point in time which there's compelling evidence which life already existed on the planet. So we call these boundaries the habitability boundary and the biosignature boundary. Now we constrain the habitability boundary by determining, okay, when did the earth form? You know, when did its magma ocean cool after the moon forming impact? And when did water condense out to form the first oceans? There's also some difficulties in this because there's a period of time when asteroids would have been bombarding the surface. And we just don't know if that would have prohibited life from emerging or erased life off the planet altogether. So there's uncertainty in the habitability boundary between 4.5 and 3.9 billion years ago. However, the biosignature boundary is much better constrained. We know from fossil evidence, the oldest stromatolites are about 3.7 billion years old, and these are layered structures that are thought to be formed from photosynthetic organisms, 
which are migrating up periodically to the light and leaving layers of carbonate rock behind. And then also light carbon signatures in those same features. So we think that life must have emerged between 4.5 and 3.7 billion years ago. So that is the when. Finally, we're getting to our last of the four W's now. Where did life begin? Well, there's actually two sites. Two potential sites that scientists uh, explore, and these are hydrothermal vents and warm little ponds. Now, hydrothermal vents, you may have heard of black smokers or the Lost City hydrothermal vents. These are essentially uh, fissures, cracks on the ocean floor where there's a volcanic chamber underneath and it releases hydrothermal fluids into the water. And there's a lot of organisms that exist there today and, and kind of use the energy from that vent to survive. Warm little ponds are much different environments. They're on the surface uh, and therefore exposed to things like ultraviolet light and uh, are much more concentrated regions where you can get higher pond solutions of interesting organics. There's a lot of differences between these two environments. And in fact, if you're trying to determine how life emerged on Earth, you really need to decide which of these two environments you think life emerged in and dedicate your research towards one of them because uh, there's not a lot of overlap between these two environments. Just to outline the differences, there's salt water in the ocean versus fresh water in ponds. And you know, this, is, this has a lot of effects on things like membrane structures. They don't really like to form in salt water. Uh, so maybe fresh water has, has a, a better chance there. There's alkaline water in, in some hydrothermal vents, acidic water in ponds. And pH plays a large role in chemistry and all the chemistry that would have been occurring to create first life. Energy sources are different between these two environments. In vents, you have proton gradients when your hydrothermal fluids enter into the salt water. And you also have mineral surfaces, which are good at catalyzing reactions for prebiotic chemistry. Ponds, on the other hand, they have ultraviolet light, which is good for photochemistry. And they also have these wet dry cycles. These things dry up in the winters and they re-wet again when it precipitates uh, in the springs. And these wetting and drying cycles seem to be really favorable for building long chains of RNA molecules. And the important thing is that it's sometimes dry. And allowing it to be sometimes dry means that you're able to uh, do these dehydration reactions and form these bonds between these uh, nucleotides. Finally, even the hypothesis for how life emerged differs depending on whether you're in vents or in warm little ponds. In vents, scientists explore metabolism first models. In other words, they're trying to find some primival Krebs cycle that uses ATP to build the building blocks of, of genes and, and of life. Whereas in ponds, we're trying to get to the first catalytic RNA molecule. So trying to get that information first to build, make copies of itself, and then worrying about getting to the metabolism of life as we know it uh, later on. We focus on warm little ponds, uh, but there are many scientists who focus on vents, and it's important that we both work uh, together, meet at conferences, and, and talk this out and, and try and figure out the, 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 the answer. So, we're gonna be focusing on warm little ponds for the where did life begin? And that means we have answered for our four W's. So now we can get going on the how question. So because we know RNA is the who of first life, we can begin to ask, what are the origins of the components of RNA? RNA nucleotides have three uh, constituents, the nucleobase, as I mentioned before, the ribose and the phosphate. So let's ask the question, how did just the nucleobase form on the early Earth? And I'm gonna give you a hint. Uh, nucleobases are found in meteorites. We collect meteorites all the time in places like Antarctica or even Canada. Um, it, they're really easy to find in Antarctica because they're on, you have a big glacier. So if you find rocks on top of a glacier, there's only one place they could have come from, which is from up. Uh, so often people go asteroid or sorry, meteorite hunting in Antarctica, but we find these things and we bring them back to our labs and then we analyze them for various organics. Now in various, uh, various meteorites, which you can see on the X axis here, there are various concentrations of nucleobases, guanine, adenine, and uracil, and you can see them here. So we can ask the basic question, 
did meteorites deliver nucleo bases to warm little ponds on the early Earth and essentially seed them so that they could react to form nucleotides and RNA and maybe first life? So what we did is we built a numerical model uh, to try and determine the fate of nucleo bases in warm little ponds once they're delivered by meteorites. And we also included IDPs, which is just dust. Interplanetary dust particles is what that stands for. And we included this because meteorites are delivered you know, as, as certain events in when an when a asteroid enters the atmosphere or a comet enters the atmosphere and then breaks up and distributes its meteorites on the surface. But there's also a lot of dust in, in interplanetary space. And it's made out of some of the similar rocks that asteroids are made out of, and therefore could contain the same organics. So we also included dust in our model just to explore all avenues for delivering nucleobases. Then our ponds, which you can see in the schematic, they're, they're subject to a lot of destructive forces. Ultraviolet light can destroy nucleobases. Uh, water slowly can destroy nucleobases. Uh, through a process called hydrolysis. And your pond solution can just sink out of the pores in the base of the pond. You know, all rocks have pores, including those that make ponds. So your pond solution can slowly seep from below and, and remove your nucleobases from your pond. So we developed this model. And I just want to take a slight aside to talk about Darwin's intuition, because this is really cool. Uh, this is a letter Darwin sent to Joseph Hooker in 1871. He said, but if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive of in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, et cetera, present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, at the present day, such matter would instantly be devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. Now, this is really cool because we're still researching warm little ponds as a site for the origin of life, uh, more than a century later, and he's, he conceived of this before they even knew about genes, you know, before they even knew about DNA and, and RNA. So this is, this is pretty impressive. When you look at the, uh, chem, uh, the protein compound that was chemically formed, now we're looking at RNA catalysts, which we call uh, ribozymes because they're RNA enzymes. And, uh, and when you look at the energy sources, they might be a little bit different too. We're also looking at wet and dry cycles, but the basic ideas that he came up with are, are still researched. Now, here is the result of that model I was talking about just before this slide. On the left, you can see the concentration of adenine, which is one of the nucleobases, in a pond over time from two different sources, either meteorites or from IDPs, these interplanetary dust particles. And each model has two curves because we had two different uh, pond environments, which we explored in this, in this figure. Now, if you look at the two bottom curves, which are from IDPs, notice that they don't concentrate in all in ponds. They actually don't reach anywhere close to uh, an, even a negligible concentration. Um, and the reason is because ponds float down slowly onto the surface of the earth and the destructive forces within the ponds act very quickly. So as you're entering in your dust, everything's getting destroyed uh, much faster than it can concentrate. So it can't accumulate within ponds. And this means that IDPs didn't deliver nucleobases to ponds, at least any that could actually form into RNA. But meteorites, on the other hand, delivered a large mass of nucleobases in a single event. And when those nucleobases outflowed from the pores of the meteorite, they reached parts per million level concentrations for a short period of time, but long enough so that these reactions uh, so that these molecules could react to form nucleotides and then RNA. But there are some issues, there are some destructive forces that you seem to not really be able to get around. UV is really one of those. Uh, if you look at the red curve here, there's a sharp drop off, and that's when the pond dries up and all of the molecules are exposed to, to intense UV light and it just destroys them all. So we need solutions to these issues uh, if we're going to carry forward with this warm little pond hypothesis. And uh, what we think is a solution for this is that actually sediment can provide a protection, a shield for these molecules and sediments everywhere in, in, in the wind. It's gonna be carried into the ponds and it's gonna protect uh, your nuclear bases from, from degradation. Just to uh, give you some takeaway points from this research, 
Uh, we find that nuclear bases delivered by meteorites maintain sufficient concentrations in ponds to react and form RNA. But the nuclear bases delivered by IDPs, they didn't. So we can stop thinking about dust as, as being a potential source for the building blocks of life. Um, we need protection from ultraviolet light, so we think sediment might have been a solution there. And maybe we're going to need protection from seepage as well. You know, the pond solution is going to continue to seep out of the pores in the base of the pond unless you maybe encapsulate those molecules in a membrane. So now we're talking about protocells. And the cool thing here is that meteorites, those same meteorites I showed you before, they contain a high abundance of membranous molecules, what are called fatty acids. And those fatty acids, when put in water, naturally create essentially cells. They create membranes and can encapsulate anything that's in the pond solution. So we think this was an important part of the story because if you're encapsulated in one of these cells, uh, then you won't fall through the pores in the base of the pond. The cell sizes are much larger than rock pore sizes. So let's summarize all this. We talked about the four W's of life. What is life? Who was first life? When did life begin? And where did life begin? And we, we did this so that we can try and understand how life on Earth began. And what we learned was that meteorites seem to have played a role. But there's much more of the story to uncover. We don't know if meteorites were, in fact, necessary or if they were just one way to get nucleobases into ponds. And what we're looking at in our research now is trying to understand what the atmosphere would have brought to ponds, just the Earth's atmosphere. There's a lot of reactions that can occur in the atmosphere due to lightning and to uh, ultraviolet light. And these things can create molecules which could fall into ponds and maybe react to form nucleobases. So right now we're exploring that avenue and, and simulating it to try and understand and compare to what the meteorites delivered. All right, so thank you. It's now time for our Q&A session. A lot of questions. So let's, let's talk about this first one here. Are there any other obvious examples? Sorry, this is from Robert Morrow. Hi, Robert. Uh, are there any other obvious examples that do not fit the NASA definition of life, like the mule? Well, uh, the other one that I mentioned in this was, was viruses, which are not self-sustaining, but that's already controversial. I mean, many people talk about whether aren't, uh, viruses could be uh, considered living by any definition. Um, but I don't have any on the top of my head of, other than those two. Uh, the, the nice thing is, is that you probably wouldn't consider a, a robot which can make copies of itself, like maybe it's programmed by us to make copies of itself using materials in the environment, you know, say, say aluminum and, and silicon. And if you develop that robot theoretically and you allow it to build itself, that wouldn't meet this definition. And the problem with a lot of other definitions is something like that might actually be considered living. Okay, next question by David Hitchcock. Is RNA self-sustaining? If not, how does it fit the NASA definition of life? So this is, uh, this is the interesting component of RNA is, is we think that it can be self-sustaining in the sense that it can make imperfect copies of itself without the need of anything else. It can do it on its own. Um, but as I mentioned, an RNA molecule that can both be a template and be copied and also fold on itself and do the copying of a template of itself uh, has not been found yet in the lab, but everyone thinks this molecule exists uh, because there are many RNA molecules which can uh, fold and make copies of other molecules. That's no problem. Um, but copies of them themselves, that's hard because they have to unfold first. So we're all looking for that molecule and uh, you know, that would be the holy grail of Origins of Life Chemistry. Okay, let's go to Biendra Kadka. If the trace of life have come from meteorites, how come we haven't found any evidence of traces of life in extraterrestrial spaces? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, looking for life beyond Earth is, is one of the most exciting areas of, of astrobiology research, especially when it comes to places like Mars. Now, Mars once had a, a wet history, much like the Earth. It probably had an, an ocean which covered two thirds of it several warm little ponds on its surface for about a billion years before it lost its atmosphere and began to be this more, more cold and arid place we know today. Now meteorites, like landing on Earth, would have also landed on Mars in the same types of warm little ponds. 
So we think that life, there could be some evidence of this past life on Mars still today, or maybe, if we're lucky, some life still thriving in the subglacial lakes that were recently discovered in the South Pole of Mars. So if we can find it there, that would be uh, a lot more compelling evidence that meteorites really did play a role and that warm little ponds were a strong site for origins of life on any body in the cosmos. All right, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Did comets deliver anything to the Earth or was it just asteroids? Now, this is interesting, kind of more of a classification uh, question more than anything. We distinguish between asteroids and comets when they're in space because they come from kind of different areas of the solar system. Comets further out, they're more ice, there's more ice there, they're more, uh, got a lot more water content, asteroids closer in. But we do not distinguish with them between them when it comes to meteorites because both of them enter into atmospheres and are capable of depositing meteorites into, say, warm little ponds or onto the, the glaciers of Antarctica. And uh, when there's actually one, one type of, of meteorite, one specific class of meteorite that we actually think comes specifically from comets. Uh, so yes, comets did certainly deliver, uh, as well as asteroids, um, nucleobases to the, early, to the early planet. Okay, this is gonna be our last question. Uh, and this is from another anonymous attendee. Oh, yeah. Do those scientists who believe the ocean vents were the origin of life share the same idea that nucleobases are the essential catalyst but simply found in a different water form? Uh, so this is, this is actually a really interesting question that's brought up a lot at scientific conferences. Uh, when, when people are studying the origins of life in hydrothermal vents, they're not really thinking about RNA at all, actually. Um, they're trying to figure out how metabolism emerged because the problem is, is that when you're completely covered by liquid water all the time, as you are at the base of the ocean, uh, you're not able to make long chains of RNA. It requires what's called a dehydration reaction to make RNA, which means you have to remove water. And that really is not very favorable when you're surrounded by it. This is why the wet-dry wet, cycles of warm little ponds are so uh, so favorable to making long chains of RNAs because when you dry, you, you create all those bonds between your building blocks to make long chains. And you just can't really do that in, in the ocean floor. So instead, uh, what they're trying to do is, you know, see if these fluids that come out of the ocean floor maybe can react to form some sort of cycle which could make uh, building blocks, which they are previously not known, you know, any sort of building block, maybe a maybe different building blocks than, than RNA, maybe different ones than DNA, um, and then see if they can get that to, to uh, form, like form into some sort of um, cell and then migrate uh, elsewhere. And um, you know, there are issues uh, with that, but there's also a lot of progress made in that field as well. And uh, I'm, no, I'm no expert on hydrothermal vents, so um, you know, if you're interested in that, uh, you, you can uh, read up on that elsewhere and uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the last question. Uh, I wanna thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and we'll hope you continue to, to uh, crave information that feeds your curious minds. This presentation was recorded and we'll send you a link along with a survey so that you can re-watch this and send it along to your friends. Thank you very much and we hope you can join us next time. This online series is sponsored by the McMaster Alumni Association as part of our goal to connect with our global alumni and their curious minds.